Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. It's that time of the year again where we provide you our choices for the best gaming monitors based on our extensive testing and research. Our last update to this series was about six months ago and there's been some new and important products that have hit the market since then. So I feel now is an appropriate time to go through and rejig some of our choices for the first half of 2022. As with our previous best of videos, we tend to talk about and recommend monitors we've personally tested and know to be good, or monitors that are very similar to products we have tested. It's always worth going back and checking out the dedicated monitor reviews we produce for more in-depth thoughts on each product. But just so you know, these recommendations are not sponsored in any way by any company, they're based on our testing and reviews. Also, the goal of this video is to go through five different monitor categories covering 1080p, 1440p, 4K, ultrawide, and HDR gaming monitors, with several recommendations in each category. But if you're interested in a specific category of display, I'd highly recommend checking out the dedicated best of videos we've produced for that category. You'll get more in-depth thoughts there, and we've just recently updated our 1440p and 4K videos for 2022. Alternatively, if you're not sure what monitor category is best for you, but you do have a specific budget in mind, we just produced a video talking about the best monitors to buy at each price point between $100 and $1,000, which may be of interest. I'll link all of those in the description below. And finally, any pricing that we talk about was correct at the time of filming, but of course you should check in your regions, given the focus here is on monitors in US dollars. We have links in the description below to check current pricing if you happen to see this video weeks or months after it went live. Anyway, let's kick this off with a look at 1440p gaming monitors. <music> If you're after a 1440p gaming monitor, the first question you need to ask yourself is what sort of 1440p monitor you want, because there are a ton of products on the market today covering many refresh rates, sizes, panel types, and price points. This can make buying a 1440p monitor daunting, but also there are so many options that there should be something for everyone, including budget shoppers. The way I see it is there's three main classes of 1440p monitor to consider at varying price points. If you're after a budget display to get you started with 1440p gaming, I'd recommend a medium refresh 165Hz-ish IPS for under $300 US. If you want something a bit better with higher performance, around $400 will get you an upgrade pick in the same medium refresh class. And then for high-end shoppers, we can start talking about today's 240Hz 1440p options. Let's start with the budget class. For most people, this is where the best bang for buck in the entire monitor market can be found today, and it's what I would recommend as a go-to choice for buyers. Pricing continues to come down as well. Last time, I think my pick was around $300 US. Today, it's just $260, which is insanely good value. The monitor I choose right now is the HP X27Q, which I actually reviewed just a couple of weeks ago. Pricing tends to fluctuate between $250 and $270 from what I've seen, but for that price you get a 27-inch 1440p 165Hz IPS display with all the usual modern features like adaptive sync support for all of today's GPUs. Previously in this category, I've been recommending the Gigabyte M27Q, but the X27Q is a better choice for several reasons. Firstly, it's $60 cheaper, which at this level is a huge price saving, and it performs just as well in key areas like response time performance. Secondly, it uses a regular RGB subpixel layout, whereas the M27Q uses BGR. This affects text clarity, and with the win here going to the X27Q because of its more traditional layout. And thirdly, you still get the benefits of an IPS display like excellent viewing angles and solid color quality. The downsides to the X27Q are that the contrast ratio isn't great, though no different to other budget monitors like the Dell S2721 DGF, and that the color gamut isn't as wide as today's best gaming monitors. We also do get decent speed, but it's not as fast as the best IPS panels of today. But for $260, I think HP are nailing the basics, and it's what I'd choose. My upgrade pick for people wanting 1440p 165Hz but at better image quality all round is the MSI Optics MAG274 QRF-QD, which I've been recommending for a while and continues to be a great choice at $420 US. It is $160 more than the X27Q, so it doesn't make sense for everyone. But for that extra cash, you get faster response times, a better contrast ratio, a much wider color gamut that is genuinely great for color accurate productivity work, and solid backlight strobing support. 
I see this as the better and more versatile choice, plus at times it has been up to $50 cheaper, so look out for sales. Beyond this, we start to get into high-end territory, and this is where 1440p 240Hz comes into play. Even if you don't have the GPU horsepower to run games at 240fps just yet, getting a 240Hz monitor will provide you with heaps of room for hardware upgrades, a better desktop app experience thanks to the higher refresh and lower latency, plus these monitors tend to pack all the performance of lower tier products. There are two products that I think are hard to ignore in this category right now with current pricing in mind. Those are the Gigabyte M27QX, which is a versatile IPS choice at $500 US, and the Samsung Odyssey G7, a gaming-focused powerhouse at $600. Depending on your needs, I think either of these two monitors will have the performance and features you're after. For most people, I choose the M27QX. I love the versatility that the IPS panel brings, and at $500, it's extremely cheap for what it does. Six months ago, this sort of performance would cost $650 at a minimum. In my review, I said the M27QX is as good as products that cost $200 more, and I think that's true today as well. It offers great response times in line with today's typical fast IPS panels, a nice wide color gamut, great viewing angles, and solid brightness. The fact that it's flat compared to the Odyssey G7's curve is also preferable, especially if you plan on using this display for non-gaming tasks, like web browsing or productivity work. The main downsides to the M27QX are that it's not as fast as the Odyssey G7 and doesn't have nearly as good of a contrast ratio, which affects black levels. The G7 is also semi-HDR capable with mediocre performance, whereas the M27QX has garbage tier HDR, though neither, I guess, are good HDR monitors. If you use your monitor primarily for gaming and want to prioritize speed, a single overdrive mode experience, and contrast ratio, then the Odyssey G7 is a great choice. Both sizes, so 27 inch and 32 inch, are typically available for around $600 or less these days. And to this day, it's the best VA panel I've seen, and one of few monitors that can deliver excellent black levels and fast response times at the same time. However, there are some drawbacks. The 1000R curvature is very curved, so it's not great for productivity work that may appear distorted on such a panel. It can also suffer from some defects like poor uniformity, scan lines, and the occasional flicker, though to what degree you suffer can be unit dependent. It would have been nice if Samsung could address these QA issues, but no such revision is been made as far as I know. Despite this, I'd pick either the Odyssey G7 or the M27QX over the ASUS ROG Swift PG279QM. While the PG279QM is an excellent monitor and arguably provides the best performance of any 1440p 240Hz display, its high price tag of $750 is hard to justify in today's market. It's not $250 better than the M27QX in my opinion, though if you do want the best, I guess it could be worth considering. <music> 4K is quickly emerging as a category to pay attention to and possibly buy in 2022. There are many more options available than previous years and lots of good stuff to consider. However, it's still a high-end category, unless you want a rather terrible 60Hz display. Getting a good 4K gaming monitor will set you back at least $600 or thereabouts, so it's not for everyone. I'd also recommend having either a decently powerful gaming PC or a current generation game console to take advantage of what 4K gaming monitors offer. The main choice right now in the 4K market is between sizes. 27-inch products tend to be cheaper and better in terms of performance, leading to a better bang-for-buck ratio. However, 32-inch monitors are also a viable choice, and this resolution is really well suited to larger monitor sizes. You'll just be paying more for the experience. For 27-inch buyers, I'm going to lump three monitors together here because all are basically the same, and pricing of all three is usually very close, only fluctuating by $50 at most, depending on the day and what retailers decide to do. In most regions, I expect these three to be similarly priced, and I'd recommend just picking the cheapest. The three in question are Gigabyte's M28U, Samsung's Odyssey G7 LS28 model, and MSI's Optics MAG281 URF. All use the same 28-inch 4K 144Hz IPS panel from Inelux, and so all deliver effectively the same response time performance. It's actually a rare case where different monitors use the same panel and perform the same. Usually we see different optimizations depending on the manufacturer, but that's really not the case here. 
These three monitors all deliver typical great IPS response time performance, and you get a single overdrive mode experience, which means you don't need to tweak settings depending on the refresh rate you're using. The 4K IPS panel is great for productivity work. It has an average contrast ratio for an IPS, decent coverage of DCI-P3, and very crisp text quality. It hits a nice balance between gaming and productivity, which gives it some versatility, although brightness could be better in its SDR mode. The main way to choose between these three products is the price. They're similar enough that I'd choose the cheapest one. There are some exceptions though. The M28U for example only has 24 gigabits per second HDMI 2.1 ports, so it's not a great choice for PS5 gamers. But for PC gamers, it does have the best factory calibration of the three. The MSI model was a bit weaker for factory calibration, but it has no HDMI issues and neither does the Samsung variant. The upgrade pick for buyers after the ultimate experience is the eSpectrum 4K, but at $900 including the stand versus $600 for the options we've just been talking about, it's hard to recommend for the average buyer as it isn't anywhere near $300 better. But it does have some advantages, including elite factory calibration that's good enough to use without any tweaking, highly tunable overdrive and backlight strobing settings, plus a wider color gamut with near full DCI-P3 support. The design is really nice in my opinion as well. If you're more interested in a larger 32-inch monitor, my current recommendation is the MSI Optics MPG321UR-QD, which can be found for about $900 US. This is an extremely versatile monitor, offering okay gaming performance, but its strength is really in color quality, thanks to its extremely wide color gamut, excellent viewing angles, and built-in color modes. As a 4K 144Hz monitor, it's well suited for people wanting to game and do work on the same display, and I'd pay a bit extra over other options to get that feature set, though I don't think it's overpriced or anything. The other option for buyers is the Gigabyte M32U, which is $750 and is more of a gaming-focused product with faster response times, but less impressive color quality and therefore less versatility. Still a great monitor that's worth considering, but more for people that primarily want to game and don't want to spend the extra $150 on the MSI model. In the 1080p product class, I think it's actually quite a simple story these days. Either you're after an entry-level monitor to get started with PC gaming, and I think 1080p is still a suitable choice if you have less than $200 to spend, or if you're more interested in a 240Hz high refresh rate option for competitive gaming with features like backlight strobing and fast response times being a priority. Amazingly, despite beginning to recommend this display many years ago, I still can't find a better bang for buck 1080p 144Hz IPS gaming monitor than the AOC 24G2, which today is being sold for just $170. It's been ages since I tested it, but I haven't managed to find anything that offers significantly better value. At best, you'll be saving $20, and that may not get you the same performance and image quality as the 24G2 offers, or its larger brother, the very similar 27G2. Previously in this category, I've recommended the ASUS VG259QM, but unfortunately, they can no longer be found for $230. We're looking at $300 minimum. But nevertheless, the 24G2 is a great choice, offering great response time performance in its class, solid color quality, and handy features like a height adjustable stand that you don't always get at this price point. The overall package AOC are offering is nicely balanced between gaming performance and image quality, so I'm comfortable continuing to recommend it. However, it is set to be replaced with an upgraded model later this year, which I'm keen to check out. The downsides to the 24G2 are relatively few, thankfully. There are two variants, the 2019 era and 2020 era models, but both are great, so it's not something to worry about, and I believe most being sold today are 2019 era units. The main negatives are simply that it doesn't have class-leading performance in any area. It's not the highest resolution, or the highest refresh rates, or best performing display. But it's so well balanced that it doesn't really matter, especially for just $170. If you're after a premium monitor for esports gaming, I haven't tested too many of these recently, but the go-to choice at the moment appears to be the ViewSonic XG2431, a 1080p 240Hz IPS monitor with advanced blur reduction features. Going on trusted reviews from sources like TFT Central, this is a great product for competitive gaming and appears to be decent value too at just $310, less than the $500-ish products I used to recommend here. So what are the strengths of the XG2431? The big one is in response times and backlight strobing. ViewSonic's Pure XP mode is highly tunable and can even be controlled via a strobe utility on PC. 
The results are excellent for motion clarity, and this is despite being an IPS panel, which used to lose to TN monitors in motion clarity quite regularly. As such, it has received Blurbusters 2.0 certification, which is a certification scheme that I actually trust. Even general color quality seems quite good from this display. The drawbacks to this monitor are mostly in areas like contrast ratio and color gamut, which are average, but still usable for gaming. So I'd get this as a high refresh rate 1080p option. The best ultra wide gaming monitor category has finally received a new entrant, and it's a worthy entrant at that, with the recent launch of the Alienware AW3423DW. This makes awarding a winner in this category very easy, as the AW3423DW is clearly the best ultra wide you can get right now. It's priced well for the features it has, and overall, I think it's actually one of the best monitors on the entire market that you can get. The big selling point to this Alienware display is its use of QD OLED technology. This means that we get proper, true HDR performance thanks to OLED's self-lit pixel structure and resulting deep, zero-level blacks. This QD OLED panel can hit up to a thousand nits of brightness for small elements and just looks great displaying HDR content. Combined with its extremely fast response times thanks to the inherent nature of OLED technology and fast 175Hz refresh rate, there is no better monitor on the entire market for HDR gaming right now. Of course, aside from HDR gaming, it's also a very capable SDR gaming monitor as well, and despite featuring OLED tech, it doesn't have some of the drawbacks we've seen from other OLED displays. In particular, full screen brightness of 240 nits is usable in most rooms, though not amazing, and there's no annoying features like automatic brightness limiters enabled when using the SDR mode. Dell also mitigates the anxiety over OLED's tendency to burn in with a three year burn in warranty. However, there are some drawbacks which do restrict the capabilities of the AW3423DW to content consumption. The triangle RGB pixel structure is not great for text clarity and can cause fringing on some content, which may be noticeable depending on how sensitive you are. I can notice it personally and have heard mixed results from others. And despite the burn-in warranty, there is still a risk of burn-in which is exacerbated when using the display mostly for static imagery like spreadsheets or other productivity apps. I'd only recommend this monitor if you are primarily going to use it for gaming or other content consumption like watching videos. Other problems include the display's coding and layer composition, which can reflect a lot of ambient light depending on your room setup. To get the full benefit of this display, I'd recommend using it in a dark room, ideally pitch black, so the deep blacks of OLED can shine. It's also actively cooled, and the fan can be heard while it's running. Despite these negatives though, you won't find a better ultra-wide monitor or better HDR gaming monitor for the price tag of $1,300 US. The main alternate to this is something like the LG 34 g 850 if you did want an ultra-wide that's well suited to productivity work in addition to gaming, but for at least $900 today it just doesn't seem worth it compared to the far superior Alienware. In this sort of price range I definitely want to spend the extra $400 to get proper HDR support, even if that meant sacrificing some usability, though this will depend on the amount of gaming versus productivity that you want to do. The other option I've recommended in the past has been Samsung's Odyssey Neo G9, which is a 49 inch 5120x1440 240Hz super ultra wide display with 2000 zone mini LED backlighting, giving it true HDR functionality. While this is a good product at times, there are several quality control issues that remain unresolved, such as scan lines, and it's quite expensive at $1900 US today. The AW3423DW is a much better buy if you're interested in HDR gaming on an ultrawide, though the Neo G9 is a different format that may tempt you if you want something super wide and immersive. Not everyone has $1300 to spend though, so if HDR isn't what you're after and you just want a regular ultrawide that's affordable, I'd recommend the Gigabyte M34WQ. It's a bit unusual being a flat 34 inch 3440x1440 144Hz IPS display, but what it offers at just $500 US is an excellent balance of performance across the various areas we test and look for. Response times are good, color performance is good, and there's no huge negatives such as dark level smearing that you do get with most budget VA ultrawides. That's not to say there are no cons here, the contrast ratio is very weak in comparison to its VA competitors, and response times aren't as fast as premium IPS gaming ultrawides, but the versatility of its IPS panel and general balance of performance is what swings me towards this product compared to others on the market. The 
the best HDR category is very straightforward as my go-to choice today is the Alienware AW3423DW. Like I was just talking about in the ultra wide section, the AW3423DW offers an outstanding HDR gaming experience and a price tag that's not too ridiculous at $1300. I'm not going to repeat myself here, so if you did skip the ultra wide category to hear my thoughts on HDR, rewind a bit to see why I recommend this Alienware monitor for HDR gaming in today's market. The only other point I want to make here is that the main reason why I'm recommending an ultra wide display for HDR gaming is that there just isn't good competition right now for this QD OLED monitor in regular sizes and formats. Yes, I could point to the ASUS ROG Swift PG32UQX as an LCD based true HDR gaming monitor with over a thousand zone mini LED backlighting, but it costs $3,000. The AW3423DW is less than half that price and provided you are more concerned about HDR than getting a 4K image, it's just as good for HDR gaming. However, we are expecting the release of several other HDR gaming monitors throughout the second half of this year, so if you're on the fence about going ultra wide or don't want the Alienware monitor for whatever reason, waiting may be your next best choice. I also think it's important to note that the vast majority of displays you see that advertise HDR capabilities don't have any meaningful HDR hardware, and therefore are fake HDR monitors, so it's important to do your research. If the monitor doesn't tell you the amount of local dimming zones, or if the number of zones isn't in the hundreds, don't even bother buying it for its HDR capabilities because the HDR experience will be poor at best. Stick to high zone count mini LED or OLED for the best HDR. Outside of the AW3423DW, honestly, the next best option is getting an OLED TV for gaming like the LG C1 or C2 series or its many derivatives that use LG OLED panels. The main advantage to the LG C1 right now is its price. Being a last gen TV, the 48 inch model is often retailing for just $1000 which is a great price for its HDR performance and much better value than any LCD based HDR monitor you can get today. The LG C2 OLED is also a good choice as it's available in a smaller 42 inch size which may be more usable on a desk, however it's priced at $1400 being a brand new release so it's less good value than the C1, but it could be worth paying the higher price for a more suitable monitor size. The usual caveats to buying an OLED TV for use as a gaming monitor apply. The C1 is also strong in terms of gaming features with low input lag for a TV, a 120Hz refresh rate, plenty of HDMI 2.1 ports and all sorts of other potentially useful processing and TV related features. However, as we described in our review of the C1, which is well worth watching as it goes into this stuff in more detail, there are lots of drawbacks to actually using this as a monitor. It's massive, especially for the 48 inch model. Uh, it requires a larger than normal viewing distance. The risk of permanent burn in and low brightness levels makes it poorly suited to productivity and everyday desktop app usage. You should really only use the C1 for content consumption. It also only has HDMI 2.1 ports. So 4K 120Hz is limited to the newest graphics cards. I'd personally choose the AW3423DW over an LG OLED TV right now, though I'm yet to test the 42 inch C2 to see if its size is suitable. But either way, that's the current state of the HDR gaming market. And that does it for today's monitor recommendation video. Lots and lots of options to choose from covering most of the categories I hope you are considering at the moment. If you do want to learn more about these monitors we've talked about today, we do have dedicated reviews for most of them that will go into the specifics around performance and features which are well worth watching. I also have longer breakdowns available for the best 1080p, 1440p and 4K monitors on the channel, though just be aware that some of those recommendations may be less relevant in today's market depending on pricing and other options since we've made those videos. Anyway, that's it for this one. If you're interested in supporting all of the monitor testing that we do on the channel, there have been dozens upon dozens of reviews that go into making these specific videos, then please do consider supporting us through our Patreon and Floatplan accounts. Links are in the description. Not only will you be supporting independent monitor testing, you'll also be getting access to bonus stuff like ICC profiles that we create for monitors, uh, our Discord chat where you can ask me questions about monitors at any time, our monthly live streams, all sorts of good stuff. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.